Hi, this is Kristen Bell, and this is my presentation, Privacy in the Digital Age, for CS305. The first thing I wanted to do was ask, what does privacy mean? What are we talking about? Are we talking about more physical things, like a key and a lock for your door, or maybe a password for your computer or your email? Uh, is it a secu security system for your home? No one looking in your windows? Or is it something more um, ambiguous, like maybe being anonymous, not being tracked, having private thoughts, freedom of movement? Is it something like not being searched and not being in a database or not being listened to by a, an electronic device or just simply not being spied on? I'd argue that privacy means all of this and more. And the second question I wanted to ask was, does privacy matter? Um, for the answer, let's go to Glenn Greenwald, who was one of the reporters who worked with Edward Snowden um, in the huge scandal about U.S. surveillance. Okay, let's go. Over the last 16 months, as I've debated this issue around the world, every single time somebody has said to me, I don't really worry about invasions of privacy because I don't have anything to hide, I always say the same thing to them. I get out a pen, I write down my email address, I say, here's my email address. What I want you to do when you get home is email me the passwords to all of your email accounts. Not just the nice, respectable work one in your name, but all of them because I want to be able to just troll through what it is you're doing online, read what I want to read, and publish whatever I find interesting. After all, if you're not a bad person, if you're doing nothing wrong, you should have nothing to hide. Not a single person has taken me up on that offer. I, I checked in. So while Greenwald's being a little bit funny and tongue-in-cheek, I think his point is pretty silly, and let's just say that privacy does matter, at least for most of us. Um, then we need to talk about something is, that is most of privacy is the idea of being under surveillance. Um, there are a few different ways of surveillance. Not all, I haven't listed all of them, but there's facial recognition now with, and data gathering, like, um, gathering your likes and, um, comments from social media. There's in-person monitoring and communications monitoring like, monitoring, like um, telephone, email, that kind of thing. And then there's back doors to data and information, like in the case of, it lets you have information on your phone that's, you know, behind a password and something happens to you and um, you don't want anyone to have that data. Should companies be allowed to provide that data to the government or other entities? And the first one I wanted to talk about was facial recognition because there is a lot of evidence that it has built-in bias in the way that it's been programmed. Um, the, the film Coded Bias really goes into a lot of that about how the um, person was working with facial recognition software and it wouldn't even recognize her face because she was black and it Besides being biased, it's also inaccurate. It recognizes people when it's not them. And there can be misuse. And what are the laws of use, really? I mean, we don't have those laws in place right now. And we need to be cognizant of whether people give consent to be um, videotaped or to have their photographs taken. Um, also, an issue is that mostly this technology is being misused on the people with the least power in society. You're not going to see like Mark Zuckerberg being um, misconstrued with facial recognition software or anything like that. So the first thing I wanted to talk was was the case of China and facial recognition. They're using it in their social credit system. So I wanted to show a little bit of a clip about the social credit system and I encourage you to watch the whole video because it's really quite enlightening. It goes into um, all the details of th the way that the social credit system works and here we go. Now, in China nobody is rating each other. Another misconception I'd like to get out of the way first is comparing it to the credit 
system, the credit score system of the U.S., so I think of things like FICO. Most of you are probably familiar with a financial credit score that rates your financial trustworthiness. It's intended to give creditors an indication of risk and how likely you are to pay your, repay your loan commitments. However, outside of transactions, a bad credit score does not prevent you from seeing your family or enrolling your kids in public school. In China, an individual's finances, social media activities, credit history, health records, online purchases, tax payments, legal matters, and people you associate with, in addition to images gathered from China's 200 million surveillance cameras and facial recognition software, by the way, do the math, that is one surveillance camera for every seven citizens. So I just wanted to make show that little clip about um, facial recognition in China. It doesn't go into the whole story or anything, but it gives you some idea that there's um, one camera for every seven people. That's a lot of cameras. <laughs> um, but it doesn't just happen in, you know, non-democratic societies. As we can see in this next clip from Coded Bias, um, there's also problems in democracy, democracies um, that people are facing because of facial recognition. The police said to the biometrics forensics ethics committee that facial recognition algorithms have been reported to have bias. Even if this was 100% accurate, it's still not something that we want on the streets. No, I mean the systemic biases and the systemic issues that we have with police are only going to be hardwired into new technologies. I think we do have to be very, very sensitive to shifts towards authoritarianism. We can't just say, but we trust this government. Yeah, they could do this, but they won't. You know, you, you really have to have robust structures in place to make sure that the world that you live in is safe and fair for everyone. your biometric photo on a police database is like having your fingerprint or your DNA on a police database. And we have specific laws around that. Police can't just take anyone's fingerprint, anyone's DNA. But in this weird system that we currently have, they effectively can take anyone's biometric photo and keep that on a database. It's a stain on our democracy, I think, that this is something that is just being rolled out so lawlessly. Police have started using facial recognition surveillance in the UK in complete absence of a legal basis, a legal framework, any oversight. Essentially, the police force picking up a new tool and saying, let's see what happens. But you can't experiment with people's rights. I don't have my face, I can't be five. Don't push me over when I'm walking down the street. How would you like if you walk down the street with someone back to yourself down? You got any Thank you. What's your suspicion? The, the fact that he walked past clearly my I would do the same. I would do the same. It's just grounds to stop no, it doesn't. The guys up there inform me that they've got facial recognition. I don't want my face recognised. Yeah, I was walking past, covered my face. As soon as I covered my face like this, you're allowed to do that. He grabbed, no, I can't. Yeah, and then, then he's just got a fine he for it. This is crazy. The guy came out of the station, saw the placards, was like, yeah, I agree with you, walked past here with his jacket up. The police then followed him, said, give us your ID, We're doing an identity check. He's like, what? Well, this is England, this isn't a communist state, I'll have to show my face. I'm going to go and talk to these officers, all right? Do you want to come yeah. with me or not? Yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> You're not a police officer, you do feel in threat. okay? We're here to protect the public, and that's what we're here to do, okay? We've just visited an incident, where an officer got punched in the face. That's terrible. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yes, justifying that. Yeah, but you are by going against what Sorry? we say. No, we are Sorry. not. You're and not. And please don't say, no, don't no, even not. start to say that. No, I'm completely understanding of the problems that you face. Absolutely. But I'm equally concerned about the public having freedom of expression and freedom of speech. The man was exercising his right not to be subject to a biometric identity check, which is what this ban does. Regardless of the facial recognition cameras, and regardless of the ban, etc. If I'm walking down the street and someone overtly hides their identity from me, 
I'm going to stop that person and find out who they are, just to see. But it's where, not where illegal. They're... But you see, one of my concerns is that the software is very, very inaccurate. Uh, that, that... that was a bit of a long clip there, but I really wanted to show how, you know, there are definite problems when you're walking around in a democratic society and you decide you don't want your pay face to be part of a facial recognition project. I mean, the guy just got um, fined just because he covered up his face. So I think that is incredibly troubling. Next, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about other types of data gathering, communications monitoring. Um, I wanted to show this clip from a TED Talk with Edward Snowden. It's from 2014, so it's kind of old. But he talks about a program where the U.S. Um, government asked... Um, corporations to join a program in order to surveil US citizens and other entities um, and basically the companies had no choice but to be a part of this data gathering mission um, so we'll let Snowden talk a little bit about it here oh I should also mention that Snowden is on kind of a robot thing because he was exiled to um, Russia because of his involvement with the um, scandal with the um, U.S. Um, surveillance. The slides are here. This is a slide of the PRISM program. And um, maybe you could tell the audience what, what that was that was revealed. The best way to understand PRISM, because there's been a little bit of controversy, is to first talk about what PRISM is much of the debate in the U.S. has been about metadata. They've said it's just metadata, it's just metadata, and they're talking about a specific legal authority called Section 215 of the Patriot Act. That allows sort of a warrantless wiretapping, mass surveillance of the entire country's sort of phone records, things like that. Who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, uh, where you travel, these are all metadata events. PRISM is about content. It's a program through which the government could compel corporate America. It could sort of deputize corporate America to do its dirty work for the NSA. And even though some of these companies did resist, even though some of them, I believe Yahoo was one of them, challenged them in court, they all lost because it was never tried by an open court. They were only tried by a secret court. And something that we've seen, something about the PRISM program that's very concerning me is there's been a talking point in the U.S. government where they've said 15 federal judges have reviewed these programs and found them to be lawful. But what they don't tell you is those are secret judges in a secret court based on secret interpretations of law that's considered 34,000 warrant requests over 33 years and in 33 years only rejected 11 government requests. Hmm. These aren't the people that we want deciding what the role of corporate America in a free and open internet should be. So the Snowden story is really too big to get into, but I just wanted to show that clip and talk about how we need to be aware of who is looking at our information. It companies, government, is it schools, employers, or neighbors? And um, for an example of how big data can be used. Um, do you care if you're being psychologically targeted with your own online activity? For example, um, a lot of people in this article I read said that they're okay sharing their data in order to be notified of a sports event versus if they were sharing their data to be politically swayed. They weren't so happy about that. Um, also, people seem to find it ethical to share data for good, like helping people get medical or mental health treatment. So um, there are a few things we can do. Uh, we can push for legislation. The Fourth Amendment guarantees our, that we are free from illegal search and seizures, but we need to make sure that we're upholding those laws. We could make ethics boards, push for public dialogue, and other creative solutions. Um, some places have banned the use of facial recognition software. Um, you, we could have laws about limiting data use, like say um, a company can only use the data for a certain reason. I don't think it's um, feasible to say 
have everybody read these lengthy terms of service agreements and opt in and out of um, information sharing all the time because that's just not going to work. But we could put laws on the books and um, also we need to know what the current policies are. Um, and I think one last word I wanted to say is that tech professionals are in a unique position to push for change because a lot of people just don't understand the technology at all um, and have not considered the ethical ramifications. So it's important as we go off into industry to um, be aware of these issues and to push for change when we can. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye.